What is Catherine McKinnon's argument against pornography? According to McKinnon, pornography not only exploits and objectifies those women who are its subjects, but it also expresses and supports the overall oppression of women in society. The subordinate status of women in pornography as well as the violence against women depicted in so many of its forms, is part of an unjust sex gender system. How did Hull House fulfill pragmatist ideals of knowledge? Adams saw Hull House as an epistemological, theory of knowledge, project, as much as a charitable program. She wrote, the ideal and developed settlement would attempt to test the value of human knowledge by action and realization. Quite as the complete and ideal university would concern itself with the discovery of knowledge in all branches. What did Anne Conway's physical pain have to do with her philosophy and religion? Anne was born December 14, 1630, a week after her father. Sir Hanig Finch, who was Speaker of the House of Commons, died. Having learned Latin, Greek, and Hebrew at home, she began a correspondence with Henry Moore. 1614-1687, who had been her brother's tutor at Christ College. Moore held her in very high intellectual esteem, and their correspondence continued after she married Edward Conway. At the age of 20, Moore wrote of her that he had scarce ever met with any person, man or woman, of better natural parts than Lady Conway. One of her motivations for studying philosophy and possibly converting to Quakerism was her need to reconcile the existence of a good, all-powerful God with pain and suffering in the world. Anne herself was afflicted with extraordinarily severe headaches all her life. At one point, she had her jugular arteries bled in search of relief. What was W? V. O. Quine's view of existence? He is famous for claiming, to be is to be the value of a variable. He meant by this that we should be committed to the existence of only those. Entities that need to be posited in order to understand and apply scientific theories. He wrote, For my part I do, qual a amateur physicist, believe in physical objects and not in Homer's gods. And I consider it a scientific error to believe otherwise. But in point of epistemological footing. The physical objects and the gods differ only in degree and not in kind. Both sorts of entities enter our conceptions only as cultural posits. What were some examples of Montaigne's famous wit?
Montaigne had sayings from Sextus Empiricus, 160 to 210 c. e. carved into the beams of the rafters of his study. His favorite, which became his own motto and the motto of the essays, was K. Seus J. E., or What Do I Know? The following aphorisms are excerpts from his essays. Wise men have more to learn of fools than fools of wise men. From the same sheet of paper on which a judge writes his sentence against an adulterer. He tears off a piece to scribble a love note to his colleague's wife. Don't discuss yourself, for you are bound to lose, if you belittle yourself. You are believed, and if you praise yourself, you are disbelieved. Even on the most exalted throne in the world we are only sitting on our own ass. Fashion is the science of appearances, and it inspires one with the desire to seem rather than to be. He who is not strong in memory should not meddle with lying. I will fight the right side to the fire, but excluding the fire if I can. There are some defeats more triumphant than victories. Age prints more wrinkles in the mind, than it does in the face, and souls are never. Or very rarely seen, that in growing old do not smell sour and musty. Books are a languid. Pleasure. Even in the midst of compassion we feel within I know not what tart sweet. Titillation of malicious pleasure in seeing others suffer, children have the same feeling. Few men are admired by their servants. The greatest thing in the world is to know how to belong to oneself. What are the main pre-Socratic texts? There are no surviving texts of the pre-Socratics, and very little is known about their lives. What is known comes to us from the writings of other philosophers, beginning with Plato. C. 428 C. 348 BCE, and Aristotle, 384 to 322 BCE, their contemporaries. And especially Aristotle's student Theophrastus, 371 C. 287 BCE. For example, the writings of Heraclitus. 535 to 475 BCE, consist of fragments, and there are only 450 enduring lines from Empedocles. C 490 to 430 BCE. Because we have no primary sources. We can't be certain how much of what is related about the pre-Socratics is skewed by the biases of their interpreters. What was Wilfred Sellers' idea of functionalism? Wilfred Sellers, 1912-1989, introduced the concept in his 1956 paper, Empiricism and Philosophy of Mind. According to Sellers, there can be no mental foundations of knowledge such as sense data. And he also rejected the pragmatist's myth of the given. By the given, the pragmatists referred to that part of experience that is not influenced by the perceiver or thinker. Functionalism, as developed by Sellers, as well as Hilary Putnam, 
1926. In his early writings, is the thesis that mental states can be defined by three things. What causes them, their effects on other mental states, and their effects on behavior. That is, mental states can be understood in terms of their functions. Which operate like the software of a computer. Why was John Locke important? As a philosopher of knowledge, or epistemologist, John Locke 1632-1704, sidestepped the metaphysical problems raised by René Descartes, 1596-1650, and offered a theory of the mind and its capabilities that grounded modern ideas of education, psychology, and philosophy of science. Locke's political views about democratic government and individual rights were foundational. Not only for the modern British parliamentary system, but also for the basic principles of the U.S. Constitution. His idea of natural law persists in practical political theories to this day. Who are some Dark Ages philosophers who came after St. Augustine? After St. Augustine's death in 430, the so-called Dark Ages, roughly 420 to 1000 CE, ensued. In 420 the Visigoths living inside of Rome sacked the city. In monasteries in Italy, Spain, and Britain, the encyclopedists emerged. What was Cambridge Platonism? No discussion of 17th century philosophy would be complete without at least mention of the Cambridge Platonists. The Cambridge Platonists were a loosely connected group of philosophers, theologians, and humanistic writers who resisted both the new science and rationalistic and empiricist attempts to base philosophy on it. Although they often were unaware of the content of the doctrines that they opposed. In spirit, they were closer to Neoplatonists, such as Plotinus, 205-270, and Proclus. 412 to 485, then to Plato, c. 428 c. 348 BCE, with healthy doses of Pythagoras. c. 570 to 495 BCE, and Marsilio Ficino, 1433 to 1499, as well as an interest in Hermes Trismegistus. A mythological figure based on the Egyptian god Thoth and the Greek god Hermes. The main Platonic influence on all the Cambridge Platonists was the idea of a perfect world. Beyond the senses, that was the cause of what we experience through our senses in this world. Those who were influenced by the Neoplatonists combined Christian beliefs with their basic Platonic view such that the perfect Platonic world was ruled by a force or a deity, like God in Christianity. Their goal was to defend true religion against Calvinism, atheism, 
and mechanistic philosophers such as René Descartes (1596–1650) and Thomas Hobbes (1588–1679). The Cambridge Platonists were not influential for the central development of philosophy. But their individual contributions nonetheless lived on in intellectual life. The basic tenet of Cambridge Platonism was the obscure religious belief. First stated by the Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, 1463-1494, that both Pythagoras and Plato based their philosophy on teachings by Moses that were expressed in the Kabbalah and other facets of the Jewish mystical tradition. Their other beliefs affirmed God's existence, the soul's immortality, and the animation of the natural world by, or with, spirit. They were convinced both that man had free will and that reason was of primary importance in religious matters. However, they were not empiricists, because they believed in innate ideas and innate principles of morality and religion, which were recognizable through intuition. And furthermore, it needs to be kept in mind that not all of those known as Cambridge Neoplatonists shared the same views. What was Sigmund Freud's interpretation of hysteria? At first, Freud, along with his mentor Joseph Brewer, advanced the hypothesis that people suffering from hysterics have buried memories of trauma. Treatment consisted in recovering those memories and a cathartic discharge of the affect or emotion associated with them at the outset. Freud thought that the source of the repression was sexual molestation by male relatives. He revised this seduction theory when he realized that if the sole cause of hysteria was repressed memories, there was no reason why it should not resolve itself by being discharged in hysterical symptoms. Taking a page from Franz Brentano, and perhaps Alexius Menon, 1853 to 1920, as well. He theorized that it could be fantasy revealing itself in the form of repressed desires that was the key. This led to Freud's Oedipal Theory. How did ideas about life change when it came to the philosophy of science? Many notions of a mysterious vitalism, or life force, at the heart of the reproduction of living beings were exchanged for materialist physical accounts after James Watson and Francis Crick discovered the double helix in 1953. Watson and Crick's discovery of the structure of DNA took the mystery out of the idea of life because it could account for the reproduction of genetic material in purely chemical terms. The double helix was a three-dimensional model of the twisted ladder structure of deoxyribonucleic acid DNA, which showed how sequences of acids and bases would replicate themselves through chemical reactions. Watson and Crick's discovery paved the way for gene-based studies in heredity, culminating in the mapping of the human genome, totality of genes, by the early 21st century.
What was dogmatism? Dogmatism, then and now, was the position that there is at least one true thing about the world that we can know with absolute certainty. What is a syllogism? According to Aristotle, a classic syllogism has a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. If the major and minor premises are true, then it is not possible for the conclusion to be false, the conclusion must be true. For example, all men are mortal is a major premise. Socrates is a man is a minor premise. And Socrates is mortal is the conclusion. How did W. V. Oquine naturalize epistemology? He did not think that knowledge could have a foundation apart from science. And that instead of philosophical epistemology there should be a scientific explanation of how we construct our web of knowledge and why and how that web is successful. Quine had a flexible view of knowledge and thought that theoretical terms did not have definite or fixed meanings. That translation was indeterminate, and that it was unclear how words referred to objects. Why were all of Charles Pierce's works published posthumously? Pierce neither published nor prepared for publication the greater part of his work. When he died, his widow, Juliet, sold his papers to the Harvard University Philosophy Department for $6,000. Josiah Royce, 1855-1916, was supposed to supervise their organization, but he died two years later. Many of the papers were subsequently lost, misplaced, allowed to become disorganized, or simply taken. The late mathematics historian Carolyn Isola, while conducting some research, chanced upon a trunk of Pierce's writings in the mid-1950s in a corner of the basement of Widener Library. The first edition of Pierce's collected papers was put together by Charles Harchern, Paul Weiss, and Arthur Burks during the 1930s. Critics have deemed this collection arbitrary and not truly representative of Pierce's thought. Because it makes Pierce seem unnecessarily obscure and does not clarify the progression of his ideas. A chronological edition, 1989, of Pierce's work, edited by the Pierce Edition Project of the Indiana University at Indianapolis, has produced more coherent results. Covering the period from 1857 to 1886, two other well-regarded efforts are Pierce's Cambridge Conferences. Lectures of 1898, 1992, and Pierce's Harvard Lectures on Pragmatism of 1903, 1997.
What is Catherine McKinnon's contribution to second wave feminist political philosophy? In the 1970s, Catherine McKinnon, 1946, began to argue that sexual harassment is a form of sexual discrimination. Outlawed by the 1964 Civil Rights Act. McKinnon and Andrea Dworkin also developed legal theory to outlaw pornography. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled against sexual harassment in 1986, largely based on McKinnon's work. And the Supreme Court of Canada has partly accepted her arguments against pornography. McKinnon's books include, In Harm's Way, the Pornography Civil Rights Hearings. Edited and introduced with Andrea Dworkin, 1997, Toward a Feminist Theory of the State, 1989. Pornography and Civil Rights, A New Day for Women's Equality, with Andrea Dworkin, 1988. Organizing Against Pornography, 1988. Feminism Unmodified, Discourses on Life and Law, 1987 And Sexual Harassment of Working Women, A Case of Sex Discrimination, with Thomas I. Emerson, 1979 What did Friedrich Nietzsche mean by power? In his Will to Power, compiled posthumously in 1901. Nietzsche is more concerned with the power and strength of the individual than in the individual's control over others. Nietzsche believed that the world was in constant flux and that the only way living things could enjoy being alive was not by knowledge of ideal or unchanging entities, but by constantly increasing their own power. The will to live was for him identical to the will to power because existence is a continual struggle. The transmogrification of values by the overman would represent a future stage of this will to power in the form of new, successful life. What was Franz Brentano's psychological theory of right and wrong? Brentano thought that judgments can be correct or incorrect and that the same held for loving and hating. If a thing is good, then it is impossible to love it incorrectly. Correctness in loving and hating is objective, as is incorrectness. Brentano was an intuitionist concerning such correctness. He thought that we could be immediately and directly aware of the fit between the emotion and the object. 1859-1938, the founder of Phenomenology, and Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, the father of psychoanalysis. He was ordained as a Roman Catholic priest in 1864, but renounced his vows after engaging in a dispute about papal infallibility. He resigned his professorship at the University of Vienna so that he could marry, and was not able to regain that position. Later years left him blind. But he continued to write in virtually every subfield of philosophy until he died. Brentano's principal writings are psychology from an empirical point of view. 1874, 
and our knowledge of the origin of right and wrong, 1889. What general philosophical problems does environmentalism pose? In more traditional philosophical terms, there are ontological and metaphysical issues involved in what counts as a unit in environmentalism. It is important to define the unit because that defines the subject matter theoretically and makes it possible to keep track of what should be preserved, in practical terms. Who was Aspasia of Miletus? Aspasia of Miletus, c. 470 c. 400 BCE, was an influential member of the Sophistic movement. She was married to Pericles, 495 to 429 BCE, considered to be knowledgeable about statecraft, and was said to have taught Socrates himself rhetoric. When she was put on trial on charges of impiety, her husband secured her acquittal. Who is Angela Davis? Angela Davis, 1944 is a world-famous African-American social critic and political activist. In 1970, she was acting assistant professor in the philosophy department at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a member of the Communist Party USA. She was also once associated with the Black Panther Party. Davis was criminally indicted for helping Black Panther member George Jackson to escape from a courtroom in Marin County, California, in 1970. The guns Jackson used were registered in Angela Davis' name. She was for a while on the FBI's most wanted list after she fled arrest. In the end, Davis was acquitted of criminal charges and was rehired at the university. Davis claimed that she never completed her dissertation because it was lost in papers confiscated by the FBI. She has since developed a distinguished career in critical writings about race and gender as well as the prison industrial complex in contemporary American culture. Davis' principal works include If They Come in the Morning, Voices of Resistance, 1971. Frame Up, The Opening Defense Statement Made, 1972, Angela Davis, An Autobiography. 1974, Women, Race and Class, 1981, Violence Against Women and the Ongoing Challenge to Racism. 1985, Women, Culture and Politics, 1989, Blues Legacies and Black Feminism. Gertrude Marini, Bessie Smith and Billie Holiday, 1999, Are Prisons Obsolete? 2003, An Abolition Democracy, Beyond Prisons, Torture, and Empire, 2005.
How did Johann Gottlieb Fichte become famous? Soon after Fichte met Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, in Königsberg. His first book, Attempt at a Critique of All Revelation, 1792, appeared. It drew connections between religious revelation and Kant's philosophy. Fichte had not shown it to Kant before publication. And Fichte's name did not appear as the work's author, so the book was assumed to be by Kant. Kant generously cleared up this misunderstanding, giving high praise to Fichte, who immediately became famous. The accolades were hyperbolic. One reader wrote, The most shocking and astonishing news, nobody but Kant could have written this book. This amazing news of a third son, the other two being Kant and René Descartes 1596-1650. In the philosophical heavens has set me into such confusion. Who was Amos Bronson Alcott? Amos Bronson Alcott, 1799-1888, was the father of writer Louisa May Alcott. He founded a school and a utopian community called Fruitlands. As a transcendentalist, he combined Platonism, German mysticism, and American Romanticism. He largely followed the teachings of the leading Unitarian minister, William Ellery Channing, who preached a gentle form of religious belief and practice, against Calvinism. Alcott's publications include New Connecticut, Tablets, 1868, Concord Days, 1872, and Sonnets and Canzonets, 1882. Most of his other work is still unpublished, except for his vague Orphic sayings that appeared in the dial, and which is representative of transcendental thought. Did Jonathan Swift go mad? Some thought he did, based on the scatological and prurient interests that his later writings expressed. For instance, in his 1732 poem The Lady's Dressing Room. After morbidly describing a long list of disgusting physical effluvia from a woman's process of cleaning, grooming, dressing, and applying makeup, he wrote at the end, Disgusted Strephon stole away slash repeating in his amorous fits. Slash oh. Celia, Celia, Celia shits. At the same time, Swift also wrote another strange poem. A beautiful young nymph going to bed, which is about a woman who repulsively removes all the parts of herself. Including prostheses, that made her seem attractive. Swift apparently had an obsession about the falseness of women. Although he was a priest in the Anglican Church, he had a 17-year love affair with Esther Van Humry, a former Tutti, whom he rejected for the younger Esther Johnson, known in his writings as Stella. Esther Van Humry or Vanessa to Swift, was the friend who left money to George Berkeley, 1685 to 1783. 
she died soon after Swift finally rejected her. Esther Johnson also died young. In 1742, Swift was pronounced of unsound mind and memory, incapable of looking after himself or his affairs. When Swift died in 1745, he left his estate to found an insane asylum. But he was apparently not insane from psychological causes. Rather, he had labyrinthine vertigo, known as Meniere's disease. A physiological ailment that was not well understood in his day. His final words were, I am a fool. Swift's Latin epitaph reads in English, when savage indignation can no longer torture the heart. Proceed, traveler, and, if you can, imitate the strenuous avenger of noble liberty. Who was Gottlob Frege? Gottlob Freya, 1848-1925, was a professor of mathematics at the University of Jena, who thought that Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, was mistaken in claiming that mathematical truth is synthetic that is, about reality. Kant had claimed that mathematical truths were synthetic a priori which is to say both true of the world and known independently of experience of the world. His task was to show how the concepts of mathematics could be defined in terms of logic alone. So that the theorems of mathematics would then appear as logical truths. If mathematics could be reduced to logic in this way, it would be shown that mathematics was merely true by definition meaning that it had no empirical content, so that it could not be about the world. Mathematics would thereby be a priori, but not also synthetic, as Kant had insisted. For what is Heraclitus still famous? Heraclitus is the author of the saying, you cannot step into the same river twice. He meant that human life and circumstances are in constant flux, like a river. Who was Nelson Goodman? Nelson Goodman, 1906-1998, criticized the idea that similarity existed in the world independently of our linguistic inclinations. Goodman was educated at Harvard, was an art dealer in Boston from 1929 to 1941, and became a Harvard professor in 1968 in his The Structure of Appearance. 1951, he developed Rudolf Carnap's, 1891-1970, Insights about the Logical Structure of the World. Later, he came to the conclusion that there are many different world structures. Depending on the perspectives of observers. In fact, Fiction and Forecast, 1954, Goodman extended his argument that Structure in nature depends on our interests with his famous Gru example.
What was the reaction of pre-Socratic philosophers to Parmenides' monism? Several philosophers after Parmenides felt he was oversimplifying things and offered more complex explanations of the nature of reality. Although these attempts did not always convince their contemporary audiences, they were greatly appreciated later on in the history of philosophy. What was Empedocles' idea about the four elements the Sicilian poet philosopher Empedocles? C 495 to 435 BCE, posited the four element theory, fire. Air, water, and earth are the four things from which everything else is made. Ordinary things like cats and rivers are but temporary recombinations of these elements. Also, the source of motion for these elements is love and strife. Love bringing them together, strife separating them. What are some key events for which Socrates is often remembered? Although Plato imports the character of Socrates into almost all of his dialogues, the early dialogues are considered to present a more accurate picture of the historical Socrates, who left no writings of his own. At one time, Socrates studied natural philosophy with Archelaus, who was a pupil of Anaxagoras. C 500 to 428 BCE. But by the time he took up philosophy in earnest, Socrates' main interests were in ethics. Unlike many Athenians, he claimed not to understand how ethics derived from religion. In Plato's Euthyphro, Socrates encounters the eponymous priest on the way to his own trial and asks him what piety is. Euthyphro responds that piety is what the gods love. Socrates asks him if piety is good because the gods love it, or if the gods love it because it is good. If something is good because the gods love it, then we need to know which gods to follow, because the gods often disagree. But if the gods love something because it is already good, then there must be a standard of goodness, or in this case, piety, which is separate from the gods. That means that the gods are not in themselves the source of morality. Euthyphro, of course, has no answer to this dilemma, and scurries away from Socrates. In the Apology, Socrates taunts and baits the young prosecutor Melodus. In a display of dialectic that is exactly what he is on trial for. He relates how he began talking to the experts in the arts and government to seek wisdom. But found that apart from their high birth, wealth, or respected positions, these experts knew less than he. Socrates swears that he has always served Athens first as a soldier and then as a citizen concerned for the virtue of its youth. He avows his own belief in the approved gods and denies that he ever tried to introduce new gods. The jury of 450 convict him with a majority of 30. Socrates has the right to make an alternative proposal to the death sentence. Voluntary exile would be an appropriate alternative, but instead Socrates suggests that he be 
given free meals in the Pertinium for the rest of his life, in place of some charioteer. The charioteers were champion chariot drivers who had high status as popular heroes, as well as athletes. The charioteers, Socrates says, only make people feel good, while he directly attends to their well-being. He also proposes first a fine of one mina, and then, at the insistence of his friends. 30 mini, still an absurdly small sum against a sentence of death. The court is not moved by Socrates' counter-proposal and the death sentence stands. In the introduction to Plato's Republic, Socrates sets up the purpose of this utopian work. By talking to a group of friends about the nature of justice. Here, Thrasymachus says that justice is whatever serves those in power. Socrates follows with a description of the psychology of a just person. But this does not answer the question of what justice itself is. Socrates then suggests that justice in individuals is difficult to define. But that insofar as the state is the individual writ large, it might be easier to understand what makes a state just and answer the question in that way. The Republic proper is Plato's description of a just state. What were Leibniz's views on embryology? Gottfried Leibniz believed in preformationism. The theory that all living things had been created at once so that their offspring unfold from completely formed seeds. Or homunculi in the case of humans and animunculi for animals. Some preformationists believed that the whole of successive humanity must have been present in atoms. Testicles from the time he was in the Garden of Eden, while others held that they were in Eve's ovaries. These two views were called spermism and ovism, respectively. The opposing theory to preformationism was epigenesis, or the idea that embryos developed in time. However, before a true knowledge of heredity or conception, together with Christian belief that mere matter could not by itself become a complex living organism. Epigenesis did not seem plausible given available evidence. Antony van Leeuwenhoek, a highly skilled Dutch lens grinder, was able to construct microscopes that magnified items 200 times. Around 1700, after having seen bacteria, he reported viewing both male and female sperm. I have often observed the sperm of a healthy man without waiting for it to become corrupt or fluid slash watery, five or six minutes after ejaculation. I have noticed a large number of small animals. I think it must be more than a thousand, on an area no larger than a grain of sand. Leeuwenhoek reported having seen tiny animals with completely formed features in pond scum and tooth plaque. As well as in the sperm of over 30 animals. He was made a member of the Royal Society and his descriptions of miniature worlds within worlds were accepted as evidence for preformationism. As well as the original creation of everything in the universe, all at once, by God.
What were the main facts about Wuol's life? William Wuol was born in Lancaster in 1794. His father was a master carpenter. And his mother wrote poetry. He studied at Heversham Grammar School and attended Trinity College, Cambridge, on a scholarship. He was elected to the Royal Society in 1820, when he was just 26. After being ordained as an Anglican priest a requirement for the post he was chair of mineralogy at Trinity College. From 1828 to 1832. He became professor of moral philosophy in 1838. Wuol married Cordelia. Marshall and became master of Trinity College and vice-chancellor of Cambridge in two separate terms. When Cordelia died. He married Lady Affleck, who was the sister of a friend. Lady Affleck died, and then Wool himself passed away after he was injured in a riding accident. His work was largely neglected until the mid-20th century. The revival of interest in his empirical and theoretical achievements has been substantial ever since. Who was Harriet Taylor? Harriet Taylor, 1807-1858, was John Stuart Mill's wife. He met her when he was 25, while still recovering from his nervous breakdown. She had been married since the age of 18 to John Taylor, with whom she had three sons. Mill and Harriet Taylor had what they described as a platonic relationship. Until the death of her husband after 20 years of marriage. At one point, the Taylors separated. With Harriet taking her daughter to live with her, while John raised their sons. Some feminist writers believe that Harriet was actually the author of Mill's The Subjection of Women. 1869 as well as other writings, such as On Liberty, 1859, for which Mill gave her great credit. Taylor's contemporary detractors referred to her as that stupid woman, and said she only appeared to have been Mill's collaborator because she was adept at repeating what he had already said or written. Taylor published very little in her own name. She was a founding member of the Kensington Society, which circulated the first petition for the rights of women. And she contributed articles to the Unitarian Journal, monthly repository. Mill was without question extremely devoted to her, and after her death he wrote, were I but capable of interpreting to the world one half the great thoughts and noble feelings which are buried in her grave. I should be the medium of a greater benefit to it. Than is ever likely to arise from anything that I can write, unprompted and unassisted by her all but unrivaled wisdom. How did Neoplatonism become popular? Neoplatonism spread as the Roman Empire began to fall after the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. 121 to 180, who was a Stoic, died. 
While early Neoplatonism began under the Roman Empire, different forms of it persisted throughout the medieval period. The Renaissance, and into the 17th century. How is Boethius' consolation of philosophy both Stoic and Neoplatonic? The consolation of philosophy was written as a dialogue in which Boethius, 480 c. 525, in despair, is visited by philosophy in the form of an uplifting and encouraging angel. What was Confucius' influence? Confucius was the most highly regarded teacher, moralist, and poet in Chinese history. Mencius, 372-289 BCE, the most prominent Confucian philosopher after Confucius himself. Held that all human beings are born with moral inclinations. Mencius' teachings have persisted as the dominant form of Confucianism to the present time. Sunzi. C. 312 to 230 BCE. Taught Confucianism as a way of following formal hierarchical social structures to achieve personal happiness. For additional information on the teachings and history of Confucianism refer to Xin Songyao and HSIN Changyao, An Introduction to Confucianism, 2000 and Chengying Chen, New Dimensions of Confucian and Neo-Confucian Philosophy, 1991 What was Greek wisdom? Although Western philosophers have always turned to ancient Greece as the source of philosophy as they know it, the ancient Greeks themselves had a view of wisdom that was broader than philosophy. The so called Seven Wise Men of Greece, who flourished between c. 620 to 650 BCE, included only one philosopher, Thales of Miletus. The other wise men were statesmen and politicians or practical leaders of men. The sayings associated with the seven wise men of Greece are Thales of Miletus, to bring surety brings ruin. Solon of Athens, nothing in excess. Ilan of Sparta. Know thyself. Bias of Preen. Too many workers spoil the work. Cleobulus of Lindos, moderation is impeccable. Pitacus of Mytilene, know thine opportunity. Periander of Corinth, forethought in all things. What did George Herbert Mead contribute to philosophy? Mead was a philosopher of emergence, in his studies of Darwinian evolution. He proposed that new forms of life change the nature of the past. Because after a new form exists, what preceded and led to it needs to be reinterpreted. Mead did not publish while he lived. 
Although his works were prepared by his students to appear posthumously as Mind, Self, and Society, 1934. What is Jerry Fodor's modular theory of mind? First of all, Fodor said the mind is largely innate and mental. Development is not formed by experience, but rather set off by experience. Cognition can be described in the same way as the operations of computers, in terms of representations. The mind is modular in that many of its computational processes are independent of others. They may send their results to other computational processes. Without having their own processes observed by the other processes. Was Ralph Waldo Emerson an abolitionist? Yes, but it took him a while to develop his position. From childhood, he thought that slavery was evil, but he relied on persuasion rather than outright opposition to it until 1837. At that time he was shocked by the murder of Elijah P. Lovejoy, an abolitionist publisher in Illinois. By 1844 he said of the abolitionists, we are indebted mainly to this movement. And to the continuers of it, for the popular discussion of every point of practical ethics. After that, he was considered a strong voice for abolition, the Atlantic magazine which also published essays by the African-American intellectual Frederick Douglass printed these words by Emerson. Referring to the slave-owning and free American states, in 1862, we have attempted to hold together two states of civilization. A higher state, where labor and the tenure of land and the right of suffrage are democratical. And a lower state, in which the old military tenure of prisoners or slaves, and of power and land in a few hands, makes an oligarchy. But the rude and early state of society does not work well with the later, nay, works badly and has poisoned politics, public morals, and social intercourse in the Republic, now for many years. What was Locke's solution to the Cartesian mind-body problem? Locke held that all of our knowledge comes to us from our ideas and that we do not have a clear idea of either material or immaterial substance. It follows from this that if substance exists, we do not know anything about it, apart from its qualities that adhere in it. For example, Locke pointed out that we can sense the hardness, color, and malleability of gold. But that we do not know what it is in gold that gives rise to these qualities. He addressed unextended or non-material substance under the subject of personal identity. Asking what it is that makes someone the same person. Locke was concerned that when a person was punished on Judgment Day, that the person being punished was the same person who had committed the crimes he or she was charged with. His answer was that in the context of divine reward or punishment on that great day, 
you are the same person if you have memories of yourself in the past. So that you know it is the same you who committed the acts for which you are being judged. Locke's refusal to posit a form or substance for the soul seemed to contradict. The Trinitarian doctrine of three attributes or natures present in one God. Some of his critics, such as British theologian Edward Stillingfleet, accused Locke of denying the possibility of resurrection in the absence of an incorruptible, immaterial soul substance. Locke's reply to Stillingfleet was to reaffirm his belief in the immortality of the soul. As a matter of faith, rather than a fact that could be proved by reason. Stillingfleet believed that some substantial form of a person's body was necessary for there to be a resurrection of that person. Locke's response was to make fun of Stilling Fleet by interpreting him to claim that the same body literally had to arise from the grave. Locke wrote, and I think your lordship will not say that the particles that were separate from the body by perspiration before the point of death were laid up in the grave. What has been Arnini's philosophical influence? Nice, 1912, broadest influence has probably been from his overall sense that there are spiritual, if not religious, values in our proper connection with natural environments. People should respect and care for such environments as an elevated activity. Many contemporary environmentalists, theoretical and practical, share Nice's intuition that human beings benefit from contact with nature and animals in deeply nourishing ways. That cannot be duplicated by commercial forms of entertainment, or even human interaction. Acknowledgement of such benefits has led virtue ethicists such as Thomas E. Hill Jr., 1951, to claim that how we treat non-human beings both reveals our own character and partly constitutes it. In contemporary environmental debates, another way of stating the deep shallow ecological distinction is via instrumental and intrinsic values. A being has intrinsic value if it is good in and of itself. Whereas its value is instrumental if its good is what it is good for. This theoretical point is important ethically in thought going back to Immanuel Kant, 17241804. Which distinguishes between categorical or absolute imperatives and hypothetical or instrumental ones. But whereas Kant thought that the only thing with intrinsic value is the goodwill of a rational creature, a human being, some environmentalists have extended intrinsic value to all living beings. How was G.M. Battista Vico a unique philosopher of his time? Giam Battista Vico, or Giovanni Battista Vico, 1668-1744, was an Italian philosopher and jurist who is credited with having founded the philosophy of history, as well as the modern understanding of history. He provided painstaking analyses of ideas in the past and accounts of how they developed over time due both to varied circumstances and events, as well as the content of the ideas themselves. 
In that sense, Vico invented intellectual history. Who was Bertrand Russell? Arthur William Bertrand III Earl Russell, 1872-1970, who was known to his friends as Bertie. Is hailed as the founder of analytic philosophy, along with G. E. Moore, 1873-1958, and Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889-1951. He studied and lectured at Cambridge University. Losing his position there between 1916 and 1944 because of his pacifist views and activism. He won the Nobel Prize in 1950. His writings on philosophical, political, scientific, and social reform topics are all in beautifully executed prose which he was said to have been able to compose from the first draft. Russell is now best known for his failed attempt with Alfred North Whitehead, 1861-1947, to reduce mathematics to logic. His theory of descriptions, his theory of types, and his ruling doctrine that the work of philosophy is to analyze propositions, the meanings of sentences and that the only propositions worthy of such analysis must have constituents with which we are acquainted, have direct knowledge of. Russell was one of the most productive philosophical authors of all time. He published hundreds of articles and essays and scores of books. Among the most noteworthy are on denoting, Mind, Volume 14, 1905, Philosophical Essays, 1910, The Problems of Philosophy, 1912, Principia Mathematica With Alfred North Whitehead, Three Volumes, 1910-1913, Why I Am Not a Christian, 1927 a History of Western Philosophy and Its Connection with Political and Social Circumstances from the Earliest Times to the Present Day. 1946, and the Autobiography of Bertrand Russell, 1967 to 1969. What happened that affected empiricism? century. Empiricism became systematized as an overall philosophical methodology with applications for science, ethics, and political science. This was largely the work of two men who did not agree with each other. William Wool, 1794-1866, and John Stuart Mill, 1806-1873, and a third, Augusta Comte, 1798-1857, who founded the new school of thought called Positivism. Comte was also important in founding sociology but can be considered here as an empiricist for his methodology. Wool was primarily focused on science and its popularization. Mill was able to bring a coherent explanation of empirical science into philosophy because his empiricism was more easily accepted by empiricist philosophers than was Wool's. Mill also extended empiricism to ethics, political philosophy, and rights for women. Kant was the most extreme empiricist to date.
and in the 20th century positivism was revisited as a method for doing philosophy in general. Did Thomas Reed have his own ideas, in addition to saying why the empiricists were wrong? Yes, and Reed was highly influential for a while. Although he is often overlooked as an Enlightenment philosopher, he lectured at King's College, Aberdeen, and held the Chair of Moral Philosophy at Glasgow. His main publications were An Inquiry into the Human Mind on the Principles of Common Sense, 1764. Essays on the Intellectual Powers of Man, 1785, and Essays on the Active Powers of Man, 1788. After rejecting the empiricist representative theory of knowledge, Reed developed an intuitionist theory of knowledge in terms of mental faculties. Reed thought that we have innate powers of conception and conviction. There are first principles that we can identify by their early appearance. Universality, and irresistibility. We could not deny an irresistible principle. For instance, sensations are operations of the mind that, together with impressions made on our sense organs, cause our conceptions of primary and secondary qualities. A sensation of smell thus suggests that there is a quality in the object causing the sensation. In analyzing vision, Reed reasoned that the data are received on the round surface of the eye, but processed within it. He concluded that visual space must have a non-Euclidean geometry of curved space. He was about a century ahead of his time in postulating non-Euclidean geometry. In addition to faculties of perception and memory, Reed posited a moral faculty resulting in conceptions of justice or injustice that may differ, depending on different people's conceptions of the same action. He also posited active powers, leading to action, according to principles of action. When Reed spoke of powers in this way, he seemed to mean capabilities in the mind. The principles of action were animal principles, such as appetites and physical desires. And rational principles that include understanding and will. Who were René Descartes' royal female correspondents? Descartes corresponded with Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia, who was very interested in applying his doctrines for clear thought. As a result of this exchange, he wrote The Passions of the Soul, 1669, which was an account of how the mind worked and was connected to the body. In the same year, Descartes agreed to move to Stockholm to tutor Queen Christina. Like Princess Elizabeth, she was drawn to Descartes' ideas and wished to be well informed and educated, in general. A small pension from the King of France had been delayed for many years. And Descartes needed the funds, as well as the honor of royal patronage. He called Sweden the land of the bears and was much inconvenienced by demands of 
The athletic young queen that he began his lessons for her at 5 a.m. Descartes had always been a late riser. Preferring to begin his day by reflecting in bed until noon. When he was a student at La Fleche, he had been given special permission not to rise early. Descartes biographers believe that the change in his routine weakened him. He caught pneumonia and soon died. What was Spinoza's legacy? Spinoza has acquired an almost saintly aura over the centuries. In 1672 he wanted to participate in a protest against the brutal mob assassination of the Dutch statesman and mathematician, Juan de Witt, and his brother, Cornelis. There was great physical risk in such participation. But the only thing that stopped Spinoza was that a friend locked him up. The 19th century romantic writer novelist called Spinoza the god intoxicated man. The 20th century philosopher Bertrand Russell, 1872 to 1970, called Spinoza the most lovable and noble of all philosophers. Spinoza is believed to have influenced the father of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud and the scientist Albert Einstein, as well as authors such as William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Heinrich Heine, Percy Bysshe Shelley, George Eliot, George Sand, and Jorge Luis Borges. Late 20th Century Naturalists as well as those who advocate a mind-body identity, have embraced his work. His cognitive account of the emotions as expressing beliefs has grounded branches of contemporary psychology, as well as philosophy of mind. The contemporary playwright David Ives' New Jerusalem the interrogation of Beric de Spinoza at Talmud Torah Congregation, Amsterdam, July 27, 1656 dramatizes both the persecution of Spinoza and the concern of Jewish leaders that Spinoza's radical thought would disrupt the fragile acceptance of the Jewish community in Amsterdam. At one point in the play, the Spinoza character quips, there is no Jewish dogma, only bickering. After Spinoza was excommunicated from his Jewish community, he could receive neither patronage nor any other employment. He therefore made his living by grinding and polishing lenses. The dust from the glass is believed to have fatally injured his lungs and been responsible for his early death. Who was Thomas Hobbes? More than any other 17th century philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, 1588 to 1679 directly applied the atomism and materialism of the science of his day to metaphysics Hobbes believed that everything in existence was caused by matter and motion He was one of René Descartes 1596 to 1650 early critics and was considered an atheist by his peers Hobbes is most famous for his description of the natural condition of mankind as solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. 